Hey, people. As you might not know this yet, I changed the name of my channel because I wanted to reflect my name instead of not. So, this is the last time I changed it. So, it won't be changed anymore. Now, Netflix came out with a documentary called Crip Camp. Okay. It should have been called Disability Camp because if you're from the um, urban neighborhood and you're around a lot of gang territory and affiliation and gang violence, this would be very confusing for the public to watch it. And I have a few qualms about it, but it also brought up the um, Willowbrook case. Um, one thing I have a problem with, it's so damn old. Like, they didn't liven it up or change it, so was it only during that time? Um, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of minorities don't speak on it. It's maybe three at the most. Even though it was during the 60s and 70s and those times. Um, like I was saying before, the representation on television. Um, because, as you see, early in my channel, I did a review on the um, Netflix movie special. With Ryan, I forgot his last name. And how much we didn't get good representation and it sucked for us. Um, when I was watching the documentary, I couldn't finish it. Because it was kind of boring. And my ADHD was like, nigga, this is boring. Stop watching this. Um, they should have, I don't know. It sucks, though, dude. And they, they've been betting a thousand with these damn disability shows and specials and shit. But, um, yeah, I need to make one of my own because it sucks. I still don't see representation of myself. I don't see me on there. And, of course, I wouldn't because I like to say I'm new or a hybrid version. So, I wouldn't be on there, I guess. But I would like to shed some light on the Willowbrook case. So let's react to the um the Can I televised. Hmm. I was like, oh. Not when I'm introing, but okay, go ahead. Since you cut me off. Oh, I was gonna say, even though as old as it was, mm -hmm. it was better than that Ryan thing. No. Because they're two different things. Okay, okay. Just like if I do my life and you see a whole lot of weed, weed smoking, butt fucking going on. That's my life. That's not necessarily. Okay. Of what? Yeah, I got. I, I feel you. Thank you. I'm sorry. It just sucked because it sucked. But yeah, it sucked. That, that's what I was saying. That wasn't. Yeah, but but this kind of sucked too, because you don't. But yeah, remember when it started though. I know, but. That doesn't help people nowadays. No, it don't. They need a new one. Yeah, they just they'll just be like, okay, that's old school, whatever. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. not really nothing huge. Remember, Tiger King is more important than that right now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that uh, nigga got that nigga got longer than like Susie. I did my nickel and I'm back in the streets. <laughs> no, this nigga got to do a dub. He, he's doing a dub and uh. Yeah, I feel. I feel didn't he get 99 years or some shit like that? That's what they were trying to give him 99 years. I didn't never finish it, so I can't tell you what happened. But anyway, uh, if he tried to kill her, that's kind of fucked up. But I, I agree with his point. But you don't take that tactic. No, she or him, and they were trying to find him. She killed her husband. But they ain't even gonna worry about it though. They already did. You know they can't find nothing. So let's get into this reaction on it. And yes, my channel name has changed. So reflect that when you talk to a beach.
I'm good. This oh, you see them VCR lines right there, y'all. That them VCR lines. Damn. Come on now. Get it started. Yeah. Good evening. I'm Bill Butel. The special report that follows is a story that started back in January of 1972, when Geraldo Rivera and other reporters from other television stations and newspapers first discovered the dismal quality of the care and treatment the state provides for its mental health. Mama, I was people. 14. The special report yeah. tells the story of the changes that have been made in 1972 and of the changes that have still to be made. The French have an expression, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Never has the expression been more appropriate than it is now. This is the Willowbrook case. Geraldo Rivera reporting. This building in Brooklyn houses the Eastern District Federal Courthouse. And this room on the sixth floor for the last several months has echoed with the frightening recital of horrors. Federal Judge Oren Judd has been hearing testimony on the case against the New York State Department of Mental Hygiene. To the people who've given testimony in this courtroom, this unprecedented federal lawsuit is known simply as the Willowbrook case, because it specifically concerns that warehouse of human misery on Staten Island. This court is hearing the story for the first time, but it's an old story, and a story that goes even beyond the locked wards at Willowbrook and beyond the case that's being argued here. And tonight we tell that larger story, our version of the Willowbrook case, the people against the state of New York. <laughs> Robert Kennedy went to Willowbrook in 1965, almost 10 years ago. He found a snake pit and he demanded change, but there would be no change. We submit what he found as our Exhibit A, our first piece of evidence in the case against the state of New York. I visited the State Institution for the Mentally Retarded, and I think particularly at Willowbrook that we have a situation that borders on the, a snake pit and that the children live in filth. Uh, but uh, many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because of lack of attention, lack of, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. In 1972, we went to Willowbrook for the first time. These are the conditions we found. This is our Exhibit B. The first building we went into is number six, the B Ward, and I was totally unprepared for what we found there. In the large bare room, there was one attendant and perhaps 50 or 60 seriously and profoundly retarded young boys. Many of them were naked, some were smeared with their own feces, all were just rocking back and forth or smashing their heads against the floor and walls. This institution in 1972 was a crime against humanity. Those aren't just words, they accurately reflect the reality of Willowbrook. It was a horrible place that New York State officials could neither defend nor explain away. Since that time, however, some significant improvements have been implemented. And this documentary, among other things, is a follow-up on what has or has not been done. Willowbrook, as it was in November of this year, is our Exhibit C in this case against the state. Under the crushing pressure of public outrage, the Department of Mental Hygiene increased the institution's budget and added 300 staff people. It also took action to decrease the number of residents at Willowbrook, reducing the total population from five to about 3,000. But despite these improvements, the expert witnesses in the federal lawsuit testified that conditions for people who remained at the institution were as bad and in some cases were worse than they had been before the initial newspaper and television exposés, a fact indicative of either supreme incompetence or grossly misplaced priorities on the part of state officials. Under the heading of Exhibit D, we present some of the specific evidence of insufficient change. It deals mostly with the physical abuse or neglect of the residents, but is not meant as a reflection on the employees at the institution, most of whom are dedicated, underpaid, and working under impossible conditions. There have been several complaints from parents of apparently battered children. How much more could he take? <laughs> He can't speak to himself. I have been to a for him. In October, an 18-year-old resident of Building 8 was found lying in a pool of blood next to his bed. Nobody saw what happened to him, but the night attendant quickly called for a doctor. 
At night, there's only one doctor on duty to care for all 3,000 residents. According to witnesses, it took the doctor 20 minutes to get from building two to building eight, a distance of about 200 yards. By that time, the resident was dead. This summer, another retarded child broke a leg. He was taken from Willowbrook to the public service hospital on Staten Island where a cast was put on. The child was then taken back to this ward at Willowbrook to recuperate. When he was returned to the public health hospital to have the cast removed three months later, the nurses there were horrified to discover that the cast had been rotted by the boy's own urine. When the cast was finally removed, it was found to be infested with maggots. By the time the, the maggots were found, uh, it was too late because we did not get any answer from the public health hospital as to what to be done, and we immediately had them removed. But we certainly do admit that uh, it should have been corrected, yes. There are no screens on the windows of Willowbrook's hospital ward, so the limbs of crippled children are inviting resting and feeding grounds for flies. And open sores like this one, not really explained, have been seen too frequently in this place. I said earlier that about 2,000 residents have been taken out of Willowbrook. Good news, but where have they gone? While some have been placed in wonderful community facilities like those run by Catholic Charities and the Association for Retarded Children, the majority have just been shifted to other substandard institutions. Operation Exodus, the program to reduce the population of Willowbrook, is a failure because many of the former residents, like those taken here to Keener on Wards Island, are worse off now than they were before they left Willowbrook. The Department of Mental Hygiene has the responsibility for caring also for the state's mentally ill as well as its retarded. And the department's record in this area leaves just as much to be desired. Pilgrim State is the world's largest institution devoted to the care of the mentally ill. Located out in Suffolk County, the complex of buildings is enormous. The wards are fairly clean now, but they're also depressingly familiar. They're filled with men and women doing nothing, going nowhere, waiting for nothing to happen. During the mid-60s, Pilgrim State, along with Kings Park, Central Islip, and other state institutions for the mentally ill, were the target of scandal and expose. They were branded human warehouses that were totally unresponsive, failing to provide either decent living conditions or rehabilitation for their residents. The critics said that the best way to care for the mentally handicapped was outside these big institutions and in the community. The state responded to the criticism with panic. They started almost indiscriminately to discharge patients. So many were set free that it permitted state officials to close down entire buildings, not only at Pilgrim State, but at Kings Park and at Central Islip as well. There are now dozens of structurally sound abandoned buildings on Department of Mental Hygiene property. This is Pilgrim State Hospital, and it's too bad it isn't Halloween because this is absolutely the spookiest place I've ever been. Behind me is what must have been one of the biggest buildings ever built on Long Island. It was put up in the early 40s. Actually, this place is like a little town. The big central building in the middle, the little church in the foreground, and lots of smaller buildings, satellites actually, to every side of it. All of them are empty. It's eerie here. It's like a ghost town. You wonder where all the people went. The answer to that question is our Exhibit H. It's called dumping. This is Main Street in the town of Bayshore, Long Island. Until recently, this was a pleasant, quiet suburban community. Its misfortune, though, is that it's located within a few miles of the big institutions. Because, as you can see, shuffling along the street at every hour of the day or night, improperly dressed, unsupervised, and uncared for, are dozens and dozens of former mental patients. In an indefensible perversion of the concept of community care, the state just put these people out, with little or no preparation, with little or no provision for aftercare or supervision, or psychiatric follow-up, they were dumped out on the streets. A whole new business was created by the emptying of the institutions for the mentally ill, providing housing for former residents. Some of the community facilities are decent and well-maintained. Most are not. The dismal Baybright Hotel, where a majority of the residents are former mental patients, is an example. Until October, there were no rehabilitative programs here at all, and now they're only minimal. Two men share one room. I asked the hotel manager about it. Lance, what rent does he pay here? Pete uh, pays 125 per month. And the other roommate also 125. Right. So that means for this room they pay 250 a month. Yes. Don't you think that's high for a room that's maybe what is this? Eight by ten and two people, 250 a month, and that's without food, right? That is without food, right? That's room and room by itself. 
With 250 a month, they could live in a whole house. Don't okay, you think that's kind of high? No, I don't. I don't. That's, that's the going rate. In Wyandanche, also in Suffolk County, there's a rundown frame house that's been rented to three former mental patients. It demonstrates how badly the state has failed in the area of community care. This slum is owned and operated by an employee of the Department of Mental Hygiene, a residential therapist at Pilgrim State. The three residents of this house, all of whom were discharged from Pilgrim State, are charged a total of $420 a month rent for the privilege of living here. My God was Richard Ballon, the social worker. The health department was notified, and uh, they did contact uh, the landlord, Mr. Powell. So he seems to be making some uh, slight attempts, but uh, the place you can see is still uh, well, disgusting. And uh, I'm aware of the fact that Mr. Powell is pulling in some uh, $420 a month rent for this place, every 28 days, that is. Mr. Powell was given the opportunity to come on and give his side of the story, but he chose not to. Long Beach in Nassau County is another community that suffered as a result of dumping. It used to be an attractive beachside resort, but the city had the misfortune of having an excess of hotels with empty rooms in the off-season. Enterprising owners got together with state officials and large numbers of former mental patients were shuttled in. One of the largest hotels on the boardwalk is the Promenade, where the normal elderly with their very different needs are now housed side by side with the mentally handicapped. My tour guide was Long Beach resident Joe French. Problem is that they're here and you can see they just sit. There's no programs for their, for their entertainment, for their diet, for their care, for their well-being, dress. And, and that's the thing the people in Long Beach are concerned about is that it may have been a great program to turn people loose out of, the, uh, out of these big institutions, but they just moved them from one institution to another where they get less care than they got in, in the institution that they were first in. Do you want to tell me the story of the mental patient who was found dead after, well, I guess an extended period of time? Yeah, I guess what happened is they, that seventh floor, the top floor of the hotel was closed off and not used anymore. And all of the elevators don't run there except there is one that runs to that floor. She must have wandered <laughs> onto that elevator, went to the top floor, and no one ever goes up there. And then she, we don't know what happened, how she died, but she, she died up there and she laid there for several months. No one went up there, so no one found it until some workman happened to go up there one day. I spoke with two residents of another establishment catering primarily to released mental patients, the Miami Hotel. Do they take care of you now? No, no, no. Nothing happened. Not that, not that going, they don't have any They don't come and help you out or take care of you? No, they don't help us. They don't have any questions. They're told, they don't have any questions. Well, there's a feeling of indignation at the State Department of Mental Hygiene at its poorly developed and improperly conceived uh, program of releasing mental patients. It's thrust large numbers of people into Long Beach without proper aftercare. Uh, it's placed an undue burden on the community, and it's certainly totally unfair to the former patients themselves. The Upper West Side of Manhattan is another area with more than its share of dumped mental patients, and again, there's a logical reason. In this case, it's the proliferation of sleazy single-room occupancy hotels perhaps the sleaziest of which is the West Side Towers on Broadway, where living conditions like this are common. The occupant of this room, a released mental patient, ran in fear when we knocked on his door. There's a person living, lives in this room. Dr. Henry Brill of the Department of Mental Hygiene responds. The uh, operation has not been fully successful. With hindsight, it's apparent now that we could have done it differently under the pressures of the, that existed at the time. Legal pressures, that is the pressure of laws, regulations, public opinion, uh, professional enthusiasm. Uh, I'm not sure that how it could have been done differently, but if I had it to do over again, I would uh, feel that we could have done it differently. Most people getting out of mental institutions need welfare benefits to survive. That's an unavoidable fact of life. The big political question, though, is who pays the welfare bill? the original county of residence, or the county the former mental patient moves into after he or she is released from an institution. This internal memorandum and others obtained for us by the independent study group from the records of the Department of Mental Hygiene are clear and to us convincing evidence that under pressure from Suffolk County officials who are angry of the dumping of residents into towns like Bay Shore, the department unlawfully contrived to prevent patients released in Suffolk from getting assistance from that county. Brendan Bushy of the study group explains. 
These people were cut off from the state and the county. They were denied resources at the welfare department, and they were denied resources at the hospital. It meant that they had to go to 